Our, our next speaker will be Sherm Swanson uh, from the University of Nevada, Reno, and he is also the leader of the Nevada Creeks and Communities team. Sherm. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. As the leader of the interagency, interdisciplinary Nevada Creeks and Communities team, we've been teaching about riparian proper functioning condition assessment, and that's going to inform especially the beginning of my talk, really the whole talk, um, because it's uh, such a good way to understand how to keep water on the land longer. If you're interested more about the, the concept of riparian proper functioning condition assessment and how you can use that for riparian management, the, the classes, the two-day classes that we teach are all online at this website. Um, we're part of the network of uh, state teams across the West that is coordinated by the National Riparian Service Team. That team has been, I think, really um, paradigm changing over the last couple of decades in helping people realize that it's all about the physical functions in order to keep water on the land longer, in order to expand the riparian resource pie or to keep it from shrinking. The heart of that system is realizing that riparian systems are built on a three-legged stool. And if you've ever sat on a, on a three-legged milking stool and had one of the legs break, you find yourself sitting on the floor. We need all three of these legs to keep working for us. And what we find is it's the vegetation that slows the water and allows the sediment to deposit, also builds the organic matter, builds the sponge that holds the water to grow that water-loving vegetation that has the incredibly high root density uh, plant systems that bind the stream banks and the meadows to allow this whole system to work. When you think about the physical functions, what we're talking about here is that when you've got the adequate vegetation, landform, soil, large woody material to do the work for us, to dissipate energy, reduce erosion, filter, capture sediment, aid soil and floodplain development, improve floodwater retention and groundwater recharge, and develop those root masses that resist erosion, then we get these wonderful things that we all care about, the increased water, water quality and quantity, especially during the dry times when it matters the most. We get the diverse seep, pond, channel characteristics that provide the habitat, the aquatic habitat, but we also get a tremendously abundant wildlife habitat. We get greater biodiversity. We get ecosystem services. And that's what we all really want to care about. But what we need to understand is how to maintain that physical functioning riparian system. What we don't want to do is have the system unravel, as we saw the slide of earlier, where we took out some of that um, dissipation of energy features of a property functioning riparian system, we ended up with a gully. We were down in the red zone there. And uh, the cool thing about riparian areas is that because we've got water, we've got resilience. And with that resilience, we can begin to grow plants that bring the system back. Now it takes time. We sometimes have to go through geomorphic processes. We certainly have to go through plant succession, but we can build system functions. And with enough of those functions, we get to what we would call riparian proper functioning condition, that green zone. Once we have the proper functioning condition, we've got decision space. We can make choices about what we want to manage for because we've got resources that are very productive and very resilient. Now, we may choose to manage for potential natural community, but we don't have to. We can manage for multiple uses as long as we keep the functions of that system. So the PFC concept is based on the fact that we have to have the functions before we can produce the values. If we have our current conditions that are keeping us from our values, then walk through the door of PFC in order to get what we want. Why PFC? Well, because it's a broad scale assessment that provides landscape scale overview of existing conditions. It helps define the scope of the issues and the problems and the opportunities so that we can develop solutions, we can develop alternatives that then can go into plans. We can assess the, the characteristics of various alternatives and think about which ones are going to be best. In the 2015 version of the stream, uh, LODIC version of riparian proper functioning condition, this wonderful concept was brought in about integrated riparian management you know, the cool thing is that people want to use this riparian assessment in order to figure out what to do. We want to fix the problems. We want to prevent the problems. And so it all starts with PFC assessment. How do you do that? Well, you do it right. You do it by having a good, solid interdisciplinary team, people that understand all of the concepts. 
you they first spend time in the office finding the the data in the files reading the manuals understanding what they need to understand when they get to the field they have hopefully by then delineated some stream reaches taken a preliminary stab at identifying the potential of each of those reaches so they understand how those three legs of the stool work there in that geomorphic setting that climatic setting that vegetative setting and then they're going to be prepared to make final adjustments and do their pfc assessment once they've done that they are well set up to go through the rest of what we would call adaptive management. And so step two in that process is to identify some of those other values because they also inform setting priorities. Those other values, some of which I've already talked about, are the thing that we all want. What we need, though, is the riparian functions in order to grow those values. Here's a classic example of riparian management that many of you have seen through the years, but the data put together here some years ago are exciting. You know, we get things that are important to us when we have these functions, and we go from a very low number of livestock that spent their summer in the riparian zone to a much greater number of livestock that were there at a different season, that allowed the plants to grow and the plants drove that system forward so that we caught feet of sediment, rebuilt the sponge and turned an intermittent stream into a perennial stream. Understanding what we can accomplish helps us set priorities. So what are the priorities that we commonly see across the West? Opportunities to restore function, especially to those functional at-risk reaches because they have something going for them, they just are at risk. And so if we can take them away from that brink of the edge, the risk, uh, then we can restore values. Sometimes we have to because we've already gone through non-functional. There's also legal requirements, various um, public land management legal requirements, also some private land management legal requirements. Sometimes that varies by state. Well-timed restoration projects or management actions can be understood what that timing is, what is the next thing that this riparian area needs, and what they need changes through time. We're going to see more about that in, in the next slideshow. Causal factors. What is it that drives the system to be at risk? What is it that would drive the system forward so that we can find the low-cost alternative, so that we can spend as the microeconomics principle says, spend our next dollar in the place where it's going to have the highest marginal reaction. How do we do that? Well, I think we often focus on the nose, focus on the story that is told by doing the repairing and proper functioning condition assessment. And uh, so here are some photos. Um, some of my grad students and I are looking at some places that are grazed by wild horses and cattle that are uh, priority sage grouse habitat, late brood rearing habitat. And we've selected a meadow in each of um, a dozen different allotments. And we find common problems. All of those meadows were functional at risk, um, as it turns out. We find that many of them had shrunk, um, and they're smaller now than they used to be, um, about 36% smaller. Why? Because they're draining. They're sending their water out the pipe instead of soaking up the sponge. Usually it's because of altered flow patterns. Usually that has something to do with stressed plants that are not very vigorous. We have inadequate stabilizing vegetation, the kind of species that grow the, the intense root systems, usually the water-loving plants. Sometimes it's too much trampling in hummocks, and especially that's a problem if we get a bare space between the hummocks that allows an erosion and a channel formation process. Bottom line is if they're out of balance. If we have more export of carbon and export of sediment, then the system drains and dries and shrinks. So what do we do about it? Well, this classic um, gully evolution sequence, I think, uh, can inform us. If we've got proper functioning conditions, we are probably managing properly. We need to keep doing what we've been doing. If we're at risk, we need to focus on what's driving the risk. If we're at that point where we really can't invest a dollar and get a good positive reaction, then we probably ought to go work somewhere else. But if we're in that place where the gully has gotten wide enough that we now have an opportunity to grow a floodplain in riparian vegetation, then we need to focus on how to do that. We can focus on recovery. And then once we get the functions back, we can again continue what works. So step four, identify the issues and establish goals and objectives. So focus on the nose, focus on the priority reaches, and 
go collect some baseline data so that you can understand how can you improve things. So objective setting, I, we often talk about objective setting in our class because it's such an important skill for people in resource management. What can you accomplish and how would you describe that? Well, it's gonna be a continuing resource at attribute that can be achieved by management. It is not the tool, it is the desired outcome that's achievable, that's measurable, and that's worth the investment of getting from here to there. They've got to be smart objectives, specific, measurable, achievable, results-oriented, relevant to the management that you're going to apply, because this is going to drive monitoring, and you have to understand how long it's going to take, and that varies depending upon the condition you were in and what you're trying to fix. So back to this gully evolution sequence. If we're focused on the risks, then the question is, um, if it's trampling, well, maybe it's the season of use. We have this problem in range management where we think our problem is fixing overgrazing. That isn't our problem. Our problem is fixing under management. So let's put the management in place that's going to allow the plants to get healthy. Maybe it's uh, changing the season of use, maybe it's shortening the season of use so that the plants aren't grazed so often, so that they have an opportunity to recover. Um, sometimes in riparian systems, our problem is coming from off-site, from upstream too much sediment. If that's the case, we need to recognize that. If we're in recovery, what are the plants that are going to drive the recovery process? If it's willows that we need, um, or willows that would allow the, the beavers to have building materials, then we need to think about how can we allow the terminal leaders to get high enough that they're no longer accessible to the animals that might cause problems. If it's sedges and rushes, rotation grazing works wonders for those. And then of course, once we've got it right, we're going to uh, continue that. I wanna show you a, a hypothetical management chain reaction. One thing leads to another. So we could do rotation grazing, we could shorten the duration, and that leads to a four inch double height or growing season recovery. And so that leads to increase in colonizers. They can produce seed and extend their rhizomes and, and we get bare areas covered over and we're covering up those inner spaces between the hummocks and herring over the walking paths. And then we get some plants to web and clog those altered flow paths and with that, um, that increased friction, we can uh, uh, increase the uh, decrease friction, we can, or excuse me, increase friction, we can decrease the erosion and increase the deposition of the, um, of the sediments and create organic matter. A lot of riparian systems are largely a sponge made out of organic matter and that comes from roots. And so with that, we get expanded opportunity to grow the stabilizing plants that have the really strong root systems. And, and then they for, form a stronger sod that is less subject to trampling. And that increases the water and the sediments and the carbon retention and the prolonged water availability. Um, it provides water to cows and to wildlife, uh, green forbs for sage grouse. They can stay uh, green uh, growing in that, in that moist sponge longer and into the July and August dry season when they are needed the most, we get resilience. And with that resilience, we have more flexibility to adjust our grazing management because it's tougher and it can take an impact and recover quickly. And we get improved habitat and water quality. And that leads to increased rancher agency and recreationist satisfaction. The happiness quotient goes up in the world and that's a good thing. So here's the question for you resource managers. What would you select out of that chain reaction to be your focus for an objective? Something that is smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and appropriately timed. A continuing resource attribute. Well, here's my answer. Oops. I think, oops, sorry about that. I think it's all about the plants. The plants, we can go measure any time we want to, pretty much any season of the year. And they're gonna drive the system forward. And because they drive that system forward, we're gonna be able to see whether we've got what it takes for that system to get better through time. Now we also have to recognize that there's some things that are out of our control. Droughts are actually pretty wonderful for in causing plants to grow toward water which narrows up that bare interspace between the green, um, green lines on either side. 
There's also the power of floods and on streams that's very important for cleaning spawning gravels or for um, um, creating pools and other kinds of aquatic habitats, uh, forming banks, forming channels. There's also the power of disturbance. Floods and fire have been part of these systems for a long time and grazing has been part of these systems for a long time with native fauna and, and certainly we can manage uh, domestic fauna so that we can have appropriate levels of disturbance. Maybe we can use that to um, trample out some small nicks to reinitiate some succession, but we've got to also allow that succession to take place. So a couple of years ago, I was asked by um, Karen Launchbaugh and others, as uh, uh, Sandy and I, and we recruited Carol Evans to help us, write an article about riparian grazing management. And from Carol, I've learned that it's really all about more good than bad, or more of what it takes for riparian systems to recover. Um, it's um, about recovering the functions, as we've talked about. And so we have two tables in that publication. One is about season duration rotation recovery. It's for those places where we have enough control of animals that we can provide recovery periods. And what we find is that it's really important to shorten up the duration in most situations. The, the persistent problem with repairing grazing management over and over is season long use, especially during the hot season. So if we can shorten that up and move it around uh, so much good can accomplish because the plants have the resilience. If we can mix that up from one time of the year to another, then that allows the plants to do everything they need to do. They do different things in different times of the year. Animals go different places in different times of the year and they eat different plants. So if we're not grazing at the same time year after year, that's good. If we graze in the spring, the uplands tend to have the green grass and the animals aren't so inclined to go to the riparian area. Um, occasional rest can be quite useful, especially if what we want to do is get the willows tall enough that they can get uh, above that, um, that um, browsable height. Stutter deferred can be useful for that. Riparian pastures are wonderful. Pastures, not exclosures. Riparian areas are actually more useful to sage grouse if they're grazed some. Grazing isn't the problem. The problem is uh, um, under management or mismanagement. And of course, one of those problems is if we don't clean the pasture because the few straggling animals can cause as much damage as the whole herd if they're there all summer long. Um, in a lot of country, we can accomplish this kind of control with stockmanship and um, low stress herding, placing animals in a new central place for them to forage from can be quite effective. Now there's other places where we've got big pastures, we don't have riparian pastures, we've got small riparian areas in big pastures and distribution is a really big issue. So what can we do? Well, we could moderate the, uh, the intensity, except that we find that when we try to fix riparian areas by adjusting the stocking rate, it is a really expensive proposition because the few animals that are left are gonna to go to the riparian area and if they're there too long, that creates all kinds of problems. We could do the cool season use when they're tending to graze on the uplands instead of the riparian area, they graze early. We can use the stockmanship to influence distribution in these big pastures. If they're having to come to the riparian area in order to get water, we can develop water somewhere else, that can help. And if that water is put close to some place where we can place some supplement that give the animals a positive post-ingestive feedback because we've complemented the energy of the dry grass with some protein, then they feel good about being there and they're gonna wanna stay longer. We can also select for the animals in our herd that are more of the hill climbers instead of the bottom huggers. And to some degree, that's gonna be the yearling cattle, the steers, well herded sheep, etc. It really comes down to the core principles. We've gotta keep our plants healthy. How do we avoid stress? We can do that with moderate use that keeps leaf area on the plant so they can continue to photosynthesize when they've got soil moisture, or we can have a short period of use that doesn't stress the plants. What stresses them is getting grazed over and over and over again every time they grow some new leaves. Whatever level of stress we do provide, we've got to provide recovery. So provide enough recovery time that the plants can completely recover before they get grazed again and then mix it up from one year to another so that we're not stressing plants at the same time in the same place year after year after year. Questions, comments?
Clayton. So the question was, how do we integrate elk and bison management into riparian management? And in some places like Montana, where the question came from, we have some real issues with that. And, uh, and certainly those are animals that we don't think we manage through riparian pastures. Um, perhaps in some places we could, not all bison are equally unmanageable, perhaps not all elk are equally unmanageable, but in many cases we manage those populations by managing the size of the overall herd. And as I mentioned, that is going to require quite a reduction with cows, I presume, and Clayton you maybe can answer this question better than I, I presume that the level of population reduction that it might take to be successful that way with elk and bison might be a little uncomfortable to some constituents. And that creates a political problem. So we have to emphasize how important riparian areas and riparian functions are to all of us so that we can be talking about expanding the pie, keeping the big pie, instead of dividing the pie up differently because as it shrinks, that doesn't give each of us a very big piece. Thank you.